and today I'm going to be discussing some research that I've been doing on um, differentiating between biotic and abiotic lipids to support the search for life on Mars. So are we alone is one of the most compelling questions that humans can ask. Throughout all of history, people have looked up to the stars and wondered whether or not there were other people like us out there, or other beings, I should say. Uh, but finally, for the first time in history, we have the capability to actually perform these searches. In addition to using tools like exoplanet analyses and radio astronomy to search for signals far away, we can also start in the solar system and go to these other planets and look for physical biosignatures that could provide evidence of other organisms. This includes things like minerals, microscales and textures, isotopes, chemical distributions, macrostructures and textures, and organic molecules, which is what I will focus on. There are many different types of organics you can use to search for life on other planets, but I'm focusing on lipids um, because they're ideal biomarkers for Mars in particular. Lipids make up the cell membranes that are universal to life as we know it. They are formed both biotically and abiotically and have been detected in meteorites and on Mars. But because biotic and abiotic synthesis mechanisms differ, there are differences in structures that could be termed origin diagnostic because they can help us figure out whether those molecules came from life or not. Certain types of lipids also have up to billion year long geologic preservation potential, meaning that they can provide evidence for ancient life up to billions of years after um, those organisms might have died. So it's ideal for looking for ancient life on Mars. There are many different types of lipids, but my focus is just on fatty acids and acyclic hydrocarbons because they are some of the most fundamental components of cell membranes. To search for lipids on Mars, I'm working with a team at NASA Ames that's designing Excalibur, which is an instrument um, that stands for the Extractor for Chemical Analysis of Lipid Biomarkers and Regoliths. And it's an instrument that will one day hopefully fly to Mars. And it works by accepting a soil sample that's drilled or scooped. It'll then crush up the sample, extract the lipids with organic solvents, filter out minerals, concentrate those lipids down 2,500 times to improve our signals, and then deliver those lipids to an analytical instrument so we can diagnose the structures and um, characterize them to see whether or not they're likely to have come from life or not. But how can Excalibur determine whether those lipids that it extracts came from ancient life or a meteorite? Um, we can look to decades of research in organic geochemistry. Uh, because lipid analyses are so prevalent on Earth, uh, we have a lot of literature to draw from, and we know that biotic and meteoritic lipid structures are well known, and they're different. Um, this, for life, this is because molecular form for reflects biological function. So you can see some common biotic fatty acids and acyclic hydrocarbons in the blue box. Um, and things like double bonds, are synthesized by organisms to help regulate membrane fluidity while incorporating branches into these structures can enhance stability. And a preference for even or odd chain links uh, reflects how they're synthesized. On the other hand, meteoritic lipids, which you can see in the orange box, um, tend to have shorter chains and more random structures. So this idea of looking at physical parameters in organic molecules as a sign of life was first proposed by James Lovelock in 1965. And he noticed that um, the distribution of chain lengths for acyclic hydrocarbons tends to follow a Poisson distribution for abiotically synthesized molecules, but for biotic systems, you see this even versus odd chain length preference, which is a clear indication of life. But since lipids have so many different other molecular structures and distributions, um, I started off this study by asking what additional origin diagnostic structures and distributions can we use to search for life in lipids on Mars and beyond? To do this, I conducted a literature search. Um, so I gathered molecular data on studies uh, that came from studies on naturally occurring fatty acids and acyclic hydrocarbons that were reported in terrestrial and meteoritic specimens. So I gathered data from over 1,500 unique samples from 220 plus studies from globe spanning locales. You can see where all the studies came from, a varying age from modern to ancient. I gathered data pertaining to three uh, types of molecular structures. So chain length, unsaturations, and branching. And I did find origin diagnostic or potentially origin diagnostic distributions for all of these parameters, but I'm just focusing on these three today because they're some of the most clear and most ubiquitous. Starting off with chain link distributions, this uh, graph right here shows the minimum or shortest fatty acid detected in each sample on the x-axis and the longest or maximum fatty acid chain length for each of those same samples on the y-axis. Blue dots are always terrestrial biotic, orange is always meteoritic abiotic, and the size of the dot corresponds to the number of samples. You can see life prefers longer chains. Additionally, 
Uh, terrestrial samples usually show that C16 is the most abundant molecule, but for meteorites, C2 is usually the most abundant. We did the same thing for acyclic hydrocarbons. Again, min and max chain length on the X and Y axes. And you can see that there's, again, a separation between life and not life, but there's a little bit of crossover for this class of lipids. Uh, for the most abundant acyclic hydrocarbon, you usually see that in the N alkane, either C17 or C27 is the most abundant for terrestrial samples. And there's no clear trends for meteorites, but short or mid chain N alkanes are pretty common. Uh, this just shows the two figures side by side. So you can see that fatty acids and acyclic hydrocarbons have similar distributions. Now moving on to branching, this heat map shows the identity of the single most abundant branch molecule that was identified in each sample. So on the horizontal axis, you can see the isomerization or the branch length and position for that most abundant molecule. And on the vertical axis, uh, you can see the number of carbons in the main chain of the molecule. So for meteorites, um, oh, sorry. So for terrestrial samples, these red uh, boxes, which indicate more samples, uh, show a clear preference for specific isomers out of many possible configurations, usually ISO C15 or anti-ISO C15. Uh, for meteorites, you don't see those same trends, and ISO C3 is usually the most abundant branch molecule. Same thing for acyclic hydrocarbons, although this only shows the biotic samples. Again, isomerization on the horizontal axis, chain length on the vertical, and you can see that there is a clear preference for isoprenoids, which are these non-random structures. For meteorites, there's usually an unresolved complex mixture, which means that there's just a ton of highly branched molecules and no preference for any one specific isomer. Um, and none of these isomers that you look at show these repeating patterns within the molecules like they do for biotic isoprenoids. Um, again, the two heat maps side by side, so you can see the preference for specific isomers for both classes of molecules. In addition to looking at each of these structures and distributions individually, you can also look at them together to improve your confidence in knowing whether or not that set of lipids came from life or a meteorite. So we did a principal component analysis on the fatty acid samples using 16 of the features I mentioned in my previous slide. And when all 16 of those features are analyzed simultaneously or additively, you can see this distinct separation between the blue biotic dots and the orange meteoritic dots. So looking at multiple different features and distributions can give us higher confidence in assessing biogenicity or abiogenicity in a lipid sample of unknown origin. Uh, so to just kind of sum up all of the results from this work, uh, basically the main takeaway is that fatty acids and acyclic hydrocarbon distributions are origin diagnostic. So terrestrial and meteorite samples display numerous patterns in chain length, unsaturations, and branching that can help us determine where they came from. Life is characterized by non-random distributions and preferences for specific conformations out of many potential uh, conformations that could be there, whereas meteorites are random. These results expand the range of potential features and distributions that could be targeted when looking for life in lipids on Mars compared to just the even versus odd chain length preference that has often been um, touted in the past. And finally, uh, we see that biological deviations or non-random patterns are key for guiding light detection approaches. So even if distributions of lipids or lipid features are different in an extraterrestrial sample compared to a terrestrial sample, maybe you don't see isoprenoids. Maybe you see something with a similar sort of structure, but it's not the exact same branch position or spacing that you see on Earth. That would still help us determine that it's probably not from a meteorite because it's non-random. Uh, finally, the main takeaway is that a single lipid sample could provide multiple lines of evidence for biogenicity or its absence if multiple non-random distributions of independent structural features are identified within one or more samples. I'd just like to acknowledge my funding source, uh, uh, 2019 NASA STMD Early Career Award, and thanks to NASA Ames, of course, YSP, uh, my mentor, Dr. Mary Beth Wilhelm, and the Excalibur team. And keep your eye out for an upcoming publication with the full range of all the figures um, that came out of this work. So thank you, and I can take any questions. Awesome, fantastic job, Denise. Um, as always, you can ask questions in the chat or raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, I think I'm gonna start personally. Um, so with Excalibur, um, I'm curious about a few things. I, I think the one that I wanna I want start with, is it possible to take multiple samples? It, it just, it feels like even, 
amplifying by 2500x, um, if the sample is, is so dilute and there's very, almost no lipids present, especially for like a Martian surface sample, 50 grams doesn't feel like a lot of material. So is, is, it, is it possible to, to, to bring multiple samples in and then go through the process? Um, yes. So Excalibur has a couple of different operational modes. So we can either take like up to nine or 12, I believe, and the number is in flux, individual samples from locations all adjacent to each other and analyze them independently. But if we do the first extraction and don't see a huge signal, we have the option to hold on to the rest of that total lipid extract and then pool the additional samples. But I think it is worth noting that 50 grams is way bigger than the couple milligram samples that uh, Sam has analyzed in Yale Crater. And considering that those samples or that material has been exposed to radiation for like billions of years, um, and we still see a signal, and we're also seeing a signal with Sherlock in um, the Perseverance rover, and the limit of detection for that instrument is like way higher than for GCMS. I think that if we target the right areas where we expect organics to be preserved long term, um, we would have a pretty good chance, hopefully, of finding something. But yeah, we can pool. Very cool. Uh, Sanjoy, I think I'll call on you next if, if there's no other questions out there. Thank you. Uh, super talk, Denise. Uh, thank you very much for, for sharing your, your most recent work. Um, I suspect the three characteristics you, you are investigating, so chain length and saturation and branching, will decay differently over time. So I was wondering if you would consider redoing your analyses, but this time separated by age. Like if you redid your analyses, but with the lipids that are you know, pre-Cambrian versus those that are more modern, I suspect the, uh, that your plots would look different, you know, depending on how old the lipids are. And it would be really interesting to see that trend or change over time as well for Earth. One step ahead of you. Um, so we included samples of varying age, but we did include some culture samples um, because we wanted to have that option to look at something that didn't have a mixed signal um, from like higher plants or animals. Um, and we did the analyses for just the geologic samples and just the culture samples just as a first start um, and found that there you do see degradation of the double bonds more rapidly. Um, but branching and chain link patterns seem to be consistent, whether you're looking at a modern or an ancient sample. But yeah, we could do more granularity as well and look at and like thin it out by individual age too. Yeah, so that's what I was getting at. Like right now you, you lumped all the geology into one data set. And I suspect the more modern ones from like a few million years ago have a different signal than the ones that are, you know, 3 billion years ago. And so looking at like the most recent I mean, we, we can mark it by geological events and looking how those change for time. Like, how did it change with the oxygenation of the atmosphere? How did it change with the, with the, the Cambrian explosion? You know, looking at, at those time markers um, and see how the degradation changes over time would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah definitely. I will make a note to look into that. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question. So excellent talk, first of all. Um, it's really, really interesting. Um, so one thought that occurred to me is that um, that I thought about um, was the Allen Hills meteor back in 1996, where people thought that they had found uh, microfossils in a Martian meteorite, and there was a huge controversy about it. Um, could this you be used to? Um, do similar investigations to that in the future where we could look in the Martian meteor, meteorite um, record on Earth uh, for these lipid biomarkers as a complementary effort to what we're doing on Mars. Because, you know, it's super low cost. We don't have to send a probe all the way there. We can just uh, scoop up what's landed here. Um, yeah, I know that there are quite a few people doing organic analyses of Martian meteorites, but one of the big problems is we only have one sedimentary Martian meteorite. Most of them are igneous. And since we expect life to have ceased, um, you know, a long time ago, at least prolific life across the surface, um, but igneous activity has continued on Mars for the bulk of its geologic history, you have to think about timing of emplacement. 
Um, so if this igneous activity came after life, it would destroy any lipid biomarkers are there. You also have abiotic synthesis that can occur through igneous processes or through electrochemical reduction of CO2, potentially. Um, so if we find organics in Martian meteorites, which people have found before, um, it's more likely, in my opinion, um, that it probably came from an abiotic synthesis mechanism. But if we did find some really screaming biomarker signal like an isoprenoid, that would definitely Definitely be a reason for us to revisit and think more about our expectations for um, timing of life on Mars and preservation through um, ejection from the surface and transport down to the surface of Earth. Awesome answer. Thank you.